Hi, I'm Hal Roberts. This is Bridge City News. Here's some of the top stories we've been following. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau discusses the game plan he and our province's premiers are putting together to tackle the third wave of COVID-19. We have a one-on-one -on -one interview with Lethbridge MP Rachel Harder, who explains why her boss Aaron O'Toole decided to support a federal carbon tax. And we have local reaction to the province's new health restrictions, which will impact our students and gym owners. Your nation, your province, your Southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Hal Roberts. Thanks so much for joining us. Lethbridge is among seven cities in the province to be labeled a COVID-19 hot zone. Premier Jason Kenney announced Thursday that these zones will now have new health measures. Yesterday's total case numbers in the province hit a record high for a single day since the pandemic began. Lethbridge Mayor Chris Spearman spoke about what these new measures mean for our city. BCN's Ainsley O'Reilly reports. The province says cities that are considered a hot spot have more than 350 active cases per 100,000 people. Edmonton, Calgary, Fort McMurray, Red Deer, Grand Prairie, Airdrie and Strathcona County are affected. Alberta Premier Jason Kenney says that curfews could be in place if numbers continue to climb. Lethbridge Mayor Chris Spearman says that they aren't considering curfews, but thinks that the Lethbridge Police Service should crack down on enforcement measures. We do hear uh, that, are, that not everybody's following the orders. Some people are actually deliberately making a point of not following the orders. And we think enforcement is uh, something that is needed now. Premier Kenny highlighted provincial crackdowns for those not complying with the restrictions. If you are given a fine and you're, you're not take, take, taking it seriously, you don't pay it, uh, you will uh, not be able to, for example, renew your driver's license and there will be other implications with respect to registry services. As for local shutdowns, the city announced they will temporarily suspend all indoor sport and fitness facilities. Uh, ATB Ice Centres, Henderson Ice Centre, uh, Corvan Ray YMCA uh, and also pools operated by Recreation Excellence. The province recently topped up financial support for small and medium businesses, but Spearman says it's not enough. What I'm hearing from the businesses is really those, uh, those financial supports from the province need to go a lot further than where they are currently. I've conveyed that same message to the Minister of Municipal Affairs in a meeting on Wednesday. The mandatory restrictions will be in place for a minimum of two weeks. For Bridge City News, I'm Ainsley O'Reilly. Regions in the province's targeted hot zones will also move back to at-home learning for students in both junior and senior high schools. About 11,000 students in the Lethbridge School Division are impacted by this decision. The board superintendent, Cheryl Gilmore, says that staff were not informed ahead of the decision. Youth and our young men and women in our high schools, um, this is tough on them, right? This is difficult and, and we all know and appreciate that it's difficult. Certainly we've got many, many students who um, love to come to school, who want to be in school and so uh, for them, I feel badly for them certainly and I know that our schools are really committed to maintaining as close as contact as possible and we have we do have synchronous online learning every day for those students and so certainly they'll feel connected that way although um, certainly it looks different in terms of connection for their you know social emotional development for sure. Rapid testing for COVID-19 in schools were announced three weeks ago by the provincial government. These tests have now been postponed for students affected by the new measures. Lethbridge West MLA Shanna Phillips says her party has been calling on the UCP government to do more to protect Albertans from the third wave. Phillips says a lot of what we're experiencing now could have been prevented. This was all very preventable and predictable. If Jason Kenney had taken the precautions that we described to them, had taken some of our advice around uh, how to reduce the spread in schools in particular, but across the province in a number of different ways, including paid sick leave, we would not be in this situation today. Many gym owners were disappointed to hear from the province that not only do their facilities have to remain closed to general fitness, but now one-on-one -on -one training has also been shut down for the next couple of weeks. Lee Mien, who owns the Canadian Martial Arts Centre here in Lethbridge, is speechless. 
I don't even know what to say anymore. It's gotten so ridiculous. Uh, they're basing everything off of the data and the data shows that the healthcare system is not overwhelmed. Um, it's been poorly ran for the past 10 years and here we are, they haven't fixed the healthcare problem, but now because of COVID, uh, which is no different than the flu season, uh, we're sitting here locked out again of our businesses and it's just not right. Um, we're not allowed to function, not allowed to operate. People aren't allowed to train and be healthy. Uh, it's proven that if people are in shape, they're less likely to get the side effects of COVID if they do get it, uh, but they're not promoting health. They're promoting everyone to stay home, be unhealthy, uh, stay locked up, be afraid, and just obey. And that's my biggest frustration with this whole thing. The province has expanded the list of who may book appointments to receive their COVID-19 vaccine shots at pharmacies or through AHS online. The list includes staff and residents who provide care or support to Albertans in facilities not previously offered immunization, caregivers of Albertans who are most at risk of severe outcomes, frontline policing and provincial sheriffs who interact with residents at shelters and remand centres, also Canadian Border Security Agency staff and firefighters, Albertans between the ages of 50 and 64, along with First Nations, Métis and Inuit between the ages of 35 and 49 are also eligible to receive their shots. Preserving and protecting the River Valley here in Lethbridge is the main goal for the Cooley cleanup this year. Residents are being encouraged to head out and clean up garbage and debris from our spectacular Cooley area. Now, one local man has been participating in the Cooley cleanup for a number of years, and he says that it's just his way of making sure everyone can enjoy nature. Micah Quinn has the details. 88-year-old Alex Onady has lived in Lethbridge for 12 years, and he says that he joined a volunteer group called the Lethbridge Lions Club, who sponsored a whoop-up trail cleanup. That's how he got his start, and he's been doing it ever since. Because I live on the west side, I, I keep driving down that trail, and I keep seeing all this stuff that's out there, and I say, you know, I, can, I got nothing else to do, so I can, I can start doing it on my own. And I have, and I... And, and, I, and I don't mind doing it. Matter of fact, I enjoy doing it because it gives me something to do without a strong commitment. And at least I don't have to look at the mess that's there. And hopefully someday uh, the wind will die down or, uh, or people won't be throwing some of the stuff out. Onity says he was having trouble holding onto the bag while he was picking up garbage. His solution was to create his own makeshift handle. I took this piece, I think it's a broom handle, cut a slit in the middle and run the... the plastic through there and I got something to hang on to now that it I'm, I'm not having the grip really hard it's automatically in my hand so it doesn't come out of my hand that easy. The Cooley cleanup started in 2008 as a result of resident feedback about garbage that was spotted in the beautiful coolies of our city. 65% of registrants have said that this is their first year of volunteering for the Cooley cleanup. We encourage everybody to document their cleanup, take before and after photos, and share it on social media because that's such a great way to motivate friends and family into action by showing your involvement and why this is important to you. And of course, we love to receive photos of volunteers out in the coolies enjoying our natural spaces here in Lethbridge. For more information on the cleanup, you can visit the Helen Schuler Nature Center Facebook page. For Bridge City News, I'm Micah Quinn. Lethbridge police say due to unforeseen circumstances, the watch program will not be available until Friday, May 14th. The watch is a volunteer-based initiative of the Lethbridge Police Service that provides a wide range of services to the downtown community and deals with issues that usually do not require police involvement. Canada's Chief Public Health Officer says Canada is making progress in the fight against COVID-19, but the number of people experiencing critical illness continues to rise. Dr. Theresa Tam says our country has now recorded 1.2 million cases of the virus, along with more than 24,000 deaths. Tam says fortunately, daily case counts have dropped in many regions over the past week, but hospitalizations and intensive care admissions are up. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau says he chatted with our province's premiers about the best way of tackling the third wave of COVID-19. Trudeau says there was also a discussion about the borders. The premiers and I had another productive meeting. We talked about vaccines, testing, and what we can do to beat this third wave. We also talked at length about borders. Premier Ford asked that we suspend the arrival of international students. Because at this time, Ontario is the only province requesting this, we're happy to work more narrowly with them. We'll be reaching out to their officials today to formalize that request. Again, I want to be clear, this is not the time to travel. On land borders, as a reminder, anyone who comes to the U.S. land border has already been tested in the U.S. 
in the last three days. Then they have to get tested again. And everyone has to quarantine for two weeks and do another test on day eight. We're enforcing very severe consequences for anyone breaking these rules. Well, this leads nicely into our poll question this week and the results on their website, bridgecitynews.ca. This week, we asked you if you think the Trudeau Liberals have done a good job during the COVID-19 pandemic. Well, 92% of you said no, and only 8% agreed that the PM and his party were doing a good job during the pandemic. Make sure you log on to bridgecitynews.ca on Monday and vote on our newest poll question. We'll air the results next Friday. So many Canadians are still upset over the Trudeau Liberals' proposed legislation with Bill C-10, which many feel is an attack on free speech. You can include Lethbridge MP Rachel Harder in that group. MP Harder says we already have a criminal code that protects Canadians, and this new legislation is a big overreach by the government. I will never be in favour of more government control over free speech. Um, I, I believe in our charter rights. I believe in Section 2B that gives us the ability to speak freely. Um, and we already have the criminal code. Uh, and within that, there are sections that protect Canadians against libel, against slander, um, against hate speech. And so perhaps instead of more legislation, perhaps we actually just need to enforce the legislation that is already in existence. MP Harder will also talk about why her boss, Aaron O'Toole, leader of the Conservative Party, changed his mind on a carbon tax and why he now supports it. That's coming up after business news. Workers at Cargill near High River and JBS Canada in Brooks began a series of COVID-19 vaccinations on Thursday. At the Cargill plant, 40 employees at a time were called off the line to get their shots. A worker says the mood inside has been mostly positive. It's clear and evident uh, through the history of what's happened in these plants with COVID-19 that the virus spreads that much faster uh, with the close proximity of the workers and uh, the, the sort of atmosphere and environment that they work in. It's important to have, um, uh, have as much protection for the employees at Cargill and JBS and all the food processing facilities if we want to maintain the food chain and continue to feed Albertans and Canadians. I think many of the members we have here don't fall into the categories that are currently available to be vaccinated, that 40 plus area. Area. Um, and so to be able to just do it right here at work, it gives them the opportunity to show that they're respected for the work that they do. There's a possibility of unsymptomatic people coming into work. Uh, there's still uh, issues with carpooling and, and congregate living that, that we can't avoid. This is what people's living situations are before they work. So uh, you just never know. Uh, that's the problem with COVID-19 and they can't live without their paycheck. A 50-year-old Alberta woman was killed after her vehicle was struck by a train yesterday afternoon near Highway 1 in Cypress County. Redcliffe RCMP say the collision occurred around 1.30 p.m. Police say the car was traveling northbound on Range Road 75 when it was struck by the eastbound train. The woman was pronounced dead at the scene and her 19-year-old female passenger was taken to hospital with non-life-threatening injuries. Both victims are from Medicine Hat. An investigation into the collision is underway. Our province's new kindergarten to grade 6 draft curriculum is flunking out in the area represented by Education Minister Adriana Lagrange. The Red Deer Catholic Regional Schools has decided to opt out of piloting the curriculum this fall. Red Deer Public Schools opted out of teaching the draft curriculum earlier this month, and yesterday, Chinook's Edge School Division did the same. Critics say more than 40 school districts, representing close to 75% of Alberta students, have now said no thank you to the UCP's education plan. A church in Saskatoon hit with a $14,000 fine for breaking COVID-19 health orders is telling police to keep away. Last month, the Fellowship Baptist Church was fined after health inspectors found the congregation exceeded the gathering limits for places of worship. On Thursday, a no trespassing sign was posted on the front of the church. The notice warns agents or contractors of the government, including police, to stay off the premises unless they have a search warrant or permission. Saskatchewan residents 40 years and older are now able to book a COVID-19 vaccination along with any frontline workers who have not been eligible until now. They include teachers, correctional staff, police, firefighters, and frontline health care workers. Those eligible for priority vaccination need to provide proof of employment, a recent pay stub, or a copy of their professional license. Age eligibility remains at 30 and older in the northern part of the province. BC's COVID-19 vaccine supply is expected to increase in the coming weeks, while the province's top doctors as officials will look at ways to improve targeted immunization. Dr. Bonnie Henry apologized and addressed the confusion surrounding many pop-up vaccination clinics in high-transmission neighborhoods. 
Every adult in British Columbia will have access to vaccines by the middle of June at the rate that we expect to go starting next week. As you know, in addition, we've been trying to reach certain populations that have not registered. And those populations, um, we have been doing targeted clinics in certain areas, doing outreach clinics, and as we saw this week um, in Fraser Health, um, trying some new and innovative ways to try and reach people through pop-up clinics or drop-in clinics. You know, I do have to say, if you're not in those communities, do not go to those communities. You will get your vaccine, and there's enough vaccine coming in the next two months that everybody will get their turn. And the, the most efficient way to do it is to register and you'll be notified as soon as your um, age category comes up and you can book yourself into the clinic that will have your vaccine for you. But yes, there were some operational uh, things that were done or not done that caused a lot of frustration and, uh, and I can see that and I absolutely apologize to people for, for the miscarriage communications and for the confusion. Um, that was certainly not the intent. A stampede at a religious festival attended by tens of thousands of ultra-Orthodox Jews in northern Israel killed at least 45 people. Medical officials say more than 150 were also injured at the event. Tens of thousands of worshippers went to the Galilee tomb of second century sage Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochi for an event that included all night prayer, songs and dance. Witnesses spoke of seeing a pyramid of people who were trampled upon through a passageway of around three meters wide. Medics said the casualties included children. Carrie Einersen will finally get a chance to represent Canada at the World Women's Curling Championship. She was denied the opportunity last year when the event was cancelled due to the pandemic. She earned her berth for the 2021 Playdowns by successfully defending her national title. This is an amazing opportunity for us to represent our country. We didn't get that opportunity last year, so we're definitely just going to embrace it. We're going to be off social media. We're just going to focus on ourselves and Team Anderson and not putting that pressure on ourselves because we're just going to go out there and do what we love and do our thing. Yeah, going into last year, we were really confident. We just came off a, um, a big win and... Um, and I think we feel the same way this year. We've had a couple really great other events here um, in the bubble and uh, we've been playing really well. So just carrying that going forward and keeping that confidence and um, and just, just keep enjoying ourselves out there and not putting that pressure on ourselves. It was another beautiful day in Lethbridge as we got up to over 20 degrees today and not a bad weekend is shaping up either. A complete look at the weather picture is coming up. You know, the record high temperature for this day was 27 degrees. Now, we didn't quite hit 27, but we still got over 20, which is great for the end of April. Jeanette Rocher is back with a complete look at the weather forecast. Jeanette, not a bad weekend is shaping up. Is it we may even get close to 20 again on Saturday? Yeah, I was hoping we were going to get close to that record too, Hal. We were not quite there yet. Uh, maybe someday soon, though. Into tomorrow, though, lots of sunshine still dealing with the 60 kilometer per hour winds though a uh, high of 19 into Sunday 30% chance of showers not too bad maybe we won't get them so showers supposed to last overnight uh, 13 degrees the high on Sunday into Monday 12 degrees the high with a mix of sun and cloud as we look into Tuesday we're looking at more of a 60% chance of showers into Wednesday up to 14 degrees and back up to 20 for next to Thursday so starting this weekend we are starting to dip down into a little bit more of a cooling trend compared to where we were today which was 24 degrees now our average high for this time of year 16 degrees two degrees is our average low 27 was our high temperature back in 1968 and in 1954 we had our lowest which is minus nine a sun rose this morning at 6 10 a.m sunset for our friday evening we'll be right at 8 47 p.m so just a few minutes before 9 p.m. Not too bad. I'm loving it. Over on the West Coast tomorrow, 15 degrees and showers. A little bit windy in the Straits of Juan de Fuca for Victoria. Keep that in mind. 14 degrees, the high in Edmonton with a mix of sun and cloud. Uh, 14 also in Calgary, although Calgary dealing with the 50K winds with a mix of sun and cloud. Not too bad wind in uh, Edmonton at all, about 20 kilometers per hour. Beautiful day on the rest of the prairies tomorrow. Saskatoon, 18 and sunshine. Look at this happening here in Regina. 23 the high, lots of sun, sunny skies in Winnipeg as well with 20 degrees. 
and barely any wind over there as well. So it's gonna be a beautiful, lovely day. Toronto, um, actually there's a fog advisory in effect for this evening, so bring in the plants if you have them out on the deck. Should rain tomorrow, 14 degrees the high, 10 for both Montreal and Ottawa with lots of sunshine. More rain expected on the east coast tomorrow, Fredericton's high 11, 10 degrees the high in Halifax, 11 for Charlottetown, and same thing for St. John's. St. John's also experiencing 70K winds and some fog. So there you have it. That is your Friday forecast. The parent company for Tim Hortons says a continued lockdown of most of Canada is the single biggest hit on the chain's performance. Company officials from Restaurant Brands International reported a profit, however, of 24% this quarter to $179 million U.S. Revenue at the company that also owns Burger King and Popeyes was also up slightly from $1.23 to $1.26 billion from the same quarter last year. But it masks the slump at Tim Hortons, which recorded a 4.9% decrease in system-wide sales from a year ago. Economists say the Canadian dollar is sitting in a sweet spot after rising for seven straight days and topping 81 cents U.S. recently. Experts say the loonie is reaching a point where it benefits consumers but does not hurt businesses too much. Douglas Porter, chief economist with BMO Financial Group, says the dollar is rising in the back of soaring commodity prices, including lumber. Other economists believe the rise could also put downward pressure on those same natural resources and export businesses that are currently driving the economy. Imperial Oil says it will raise its dividend by more than 22% after reporting a first quarter profit of $392 million. That compares with a loss of $188 million a year earlier. Revenue totaled nearly $7 billion. That's up from $6.69 billion in the first three months of 2020. The increase came as Imperial saw its highest first quarter production in 30 years of 432,000 gross oil equivalent barrels per day. A group of small business owners say Ontario's recently announced paid sick leave plan would be inadequate even without the COVID-19 pandemic and it's unfair to smaller businesses. The Ford government's worker income protection benefit would provide three days of paid sick leave with the province reimbursing employers up to $200 a day for what they pay out through the program. Small businesses which already provide paid sick leave would not be similarly reimbursed. The group says targeted financial support should be available for small businesses with actual needs rather than big chains that are making a profit during the pandemic. Now is a look at today's markets. The TSX was down 147 points in the day to finish at 19,108. The Dow was down 185 points to 33,875. The S&P 500 was down 30 points to 4181, and the Nasdaq was down 119 points in the day to 13963. West Texas Intermediate Oil was down $1.43 to 6358 US per barrel. Natural gas was up 2 cents to 293 US. Gold was down 304 to 1769.13 US an ounce, and silver was down 18 cents to 2592 US an ounce. Wheat is at $339 per metric ton. Barley's at $349, canola's at $856, and corn is at $402 per metric ton. Live cattle were down $348 to $116, feeder cattle were down $225 to $133.60, and lean hogs were up $1.40 to $110.13. The Canadian dollar was down slightly over the past 24 hours to $81.37 US. Recapping one of our top stories this hour, Canada's Chief Public Health Officer says Canada is making progress in the fight against COVID-19, but the number of people experiencing critical illness continues to rise. Dr. Theresa Tam says our country now has recorded 1.2 million cases of the virus, along with more than 24,000 deaths. Tam says fortunately, daily case counts have dropped in many regions over the past week, but hospitalizations and intensive care admissions are up. Coming up, an interview with Lethbridge MP Rachel Harder, who will discuss some of the biggest stories coming out of the Hill, including why her boss, Tory leader Aaron O'Toole, decided to change his mind and support a federal carbon tax. That Q&A with MP Harder is coming up next. The Trudeau Liberals are still envisioning $10 per day daycare for Canadians, but not all are in favour of it. Joining me now to discuss this and other big stories from the Hill is Lethbridge MP Rachel Harder. Rachel, Alberta Premier Jason Kenney was not in favour of the Liberals' plan since he says it only works for those who work 9 to 5 and will be union-run. What are your thoughts? 
Yeah, Hal, thank you so much for having me out tonight. And uh, certainly you're asking a really important question. You know, there are many parents across this country who uh, work, you know, what we might call non-traditional hours. And, and of course, also with COVID, you know, more and more people are needing to adjust the way that their children are looked after. Um, that being the case, you know, I think what we see from the Liberals is kind of a one size fits all type of approach, which isn't necessarily the case. Um, but more importantly, I think what we see here is, you know, yet it's, 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 it's the same promise that they've been repeating for years, just repeated once again. So it's a matter of perpetual promising and no action. Um, and that's, that's really what this is, a, you know, an example of. And so they made the promise. We have yet to see whether or not they'll follow through on it. Um, but I think it's important to know here as well that really it should be left up to parents. Um, you know, as a conservative, I, I very much believe that parents have the freedom to choose, uh, that they should be able to determine where their money goes. And then, of course, you know, you'll have people say, well, it's, it's you know, it's going to be free or minimal cost. Well, <laughs> let's be honest. Governments have no way of generating an income other than taxation. So actually, with all due respect, Canadians will be paying for this daycare. Um, and they may not want that to be run by the state. Many Canadians are also very concerned with the Liberals' Bill C-10, which many argue would infringe upon our freedom of speech. Calgary MP Michelle Rempel already blasted the Liberals on this bill. The Liberal Party says, listen, we just want to control the amount of fake news on YouTube and social media. Well, what do you think? Well, who, who gets to determine what is fake news and what isn't, you know? Um, bottom line is this. I will never be in favour of more government control over free speech. Um, I, I believe in our charter rights. I believe in section 2B that gives us the ability to speak freely. Um, and we already have the criminal code. Uh, and within that, there are sections that protect Canadians against libel, against slander, um, against hate speech. And so perhaps instead of more legislation, perhaps we actually just need to enforce the legislation that is already in existence. So when it comes to Bill C-10, what we see is actually, you know, a government that is wanting to reach way too far um, into our social media platforms and dictate what we can and cannot show. You know, I mean, this legislation would go so far as to regulate, you know, the videos that you post of your kids or your cat or you dancing in the kitchen. And, and you know, it's just unnecessary. We don't we don't need or want a government that to, to do that. Or do you feel that maybe, perhaps as well, it may not be fitting with their agenda and their ideologies? So, hey, let's regulate that and let's cut it off at the head. Hell, I think there's certainly potential for that. You know, um, I, I've done a fair bit of reading with regards to Bill C-10 and, and talked to a number of different experts on this topic. Um, and certainly, you know, they would say that there is a, a great deal of potential for the Liberals to abuse authority when it comes to this. Um, and by that, what I mean is they, they get to dictate the terms. Um, so they kind of can make themselves the internet czar, if you will, being, being the arbiters of, of truth and what is allowed to stand and what isn't. That's a really scary place for us as a country to, to head toward. Um, we, we don't want to do that. It, it, we, we do not want to do that. We must defend freedom of speech. Amen to that. Rachel, a top government official defended his department's procurement practices recently following allegations that the Liberals have continued to award hundreds of millions of dollars in contracts to a single network technology provider. Now, Rachel, would this not essentially shut out competing bidders? Yeah, that's exactly the problem here. Um, you know, so, so I, as... Um, as official opposition critic for digital government, this is under my portfolio. And so I've been paying careful attention to this. Essentially, you know, what, what appears to be happening is there seems to be sole source, a sole source contract that is granted to a, a particular company over and over and over and over again. It's, a, it's actually not just a one-off, it's, it's perpetual, like what you're saying, um, which then of course is keeping other companies away from the table, unable to bid, um, and then, of course, unable to secure some of these government contracts, which, as you can imagine, um, are fairly attractive contracts. And so there's a problem here because we know that when competition is thwarted, when it is not allowed, we know that ultimately the taxpayer pays far more. And, and what our goal should be, what my goal for Canadians is, is that they would get the best service at the best price. And when competition doesn't take place, 
it, again, Canadians are the ones who get hurt in the end. Now, you've gone on record of being a big supporter of Alberta's oil and gas industry, Rachel, and believe that the Trudeau Liberals may not be quite as supportive. You say that Ottawa fails to realize there are technological breakthroughs that reduce carbon emissions. Tell me more about that. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I, I think here, here in Canada, we lead the world in terms of carbon capture technology and uh, in terms of making oil, the oil and gas sector increasingly environmentally friendly. Um, you know, we, we should be boasting about the technology that we have, about the innovation that is taking place within the industry. And unfortunately, the Prime Minister is taking the opposite approach, where he he actually seems to be, you know, giving, giving the industry this big black mark, um, which is just totally unfair. Hell, we're talking about an industry that upholds the greatest environmental standards in the world. We're talking about an industry uh, where human rights are not only protected, but I would say where some of the highest paying jobs are found. Um, we're looking at an industry where some of the greatest advances in technology and innovation are taking place. Um, this is an industry that deserves to be celebrated. And with all due respect, without hydrocarbons, which is really what we're talking about here, uh, life as we know it fails to exist. I mean, everything from the shoes we wear to the glasses we have, to the cars we drive, to having our homes heated, I, I, this, this is our reality. We're talking about the fuel of life. And I think that there is... Um, there is a, a great deal of importance in terms of being able to advocate for this industry and make sure that it thrives. Let's talk about those two words now, carbon tax, two words that leave a very bitter taste in the mouths of many Canadians, including here in Alberta. Rachel, now I've seen images and I remember Conservative Party leader Aaron O'Toole saying that he was going to sign a document to do away with the federal tar carbon tax, yet he recently came out with his own carbon tax plan. And that didn't sit well with the Canadian Taxpayers Federation and many other Canadians who feel that Mr. O'Toole may have gone back on his word. How do you respond to that? Yeah, how I, you know what, I, I, I actually certainly, I can understand. I can understand where their frustration comes from. I can understand where their point of view comes from. Um, you know, at the end of the day, I, I think, you know, what the leader was trying to do here is he was looking at polling, he was looking at popular public opinion, he was looking at the fact that the political left has owned this issue for so long. Um, and because public opinion is on that side of wanting a carbon tax, uh, you know, he, he went in that direction with his own creative improvisation. That said, I think other parts of our plan that are worth highlighting are things like, you know, increased attention and um, investment being made towards technology, towards innovation, towards carbon capture, towards alternate fuels, um, you know, and I think wanting to make uh, that, that comeback in terms of doing two things, caring for the environment, but also making sure that we're not thwarting our economic advantage as a country and our place on the world stage. Here in southwestern Alberta, as you know, being in the constituency right now, we're really big when it comes to agriculture. Very, very big. It's a big part of our industry here and Canada's GDP. Rachel, can you explain right now what help is readily available to our farmers who may need a little bit of help during the COVID-19 pandemic? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, when it comes to our producers, and of course, I'm, I'm extremely proud of them, I believe that agriculture is our unsung superpower. Um, these are the men and women who feed not only this country, but the world. And I'm incredibly proud of the technology and the innovation and the and and the the creativity that comes out of this industry and the way that people conduct themselves. It's, it's amazing. And uh, I wish every Canadian would join me in celebrating these individuals and, and all that they've made possible. Look, Hal, at the end of the day, I don't know that this is a group that's necessarily asking for handouts. I would say more than anything here in the constituency of Lethbridge, what I'm hearing from producers is that they actually want the government to stay out. Um, they want to see as little red tape as possible, uh, as little regulation as possible. They want to be given the freedom to thrive, to be creative, to be innovative, to produce food that not only feeds our nation, but feeds the globe. Now that millions of COVID-19 vaccines are flooding the provinces right now, Rachel, do you feel that maybe Prime Minister Justin Trudeau may call a late spring election? And is your party prepared for it? Yeah, Hal, there's certainly been a lot of speculation around this, and so it's a good question. Um, it's certainly one of the questions that I've had. Uh, you know, are we going to have a spring election? Are we going to have a fall election? Is there going to be an election at all in 2021? Uh, those are, are good questions. Here's what I can tell you. 
Uh, when I look at budget 2021, which just came out about a week and a half ago, um, when I look at that, what I see is um, I, I see more of an election platform than I do a plan to get through the pandemic. And, uh, and so there, it, there's definitely points within it that are quite partisan in nature, very beneficial to the Liberals. Um, I think, you know, the Prime Minister is going to keep his options open. That's, that's really what I believe is happening here. And so he's going to continue to look at the polls. And if the polling shows that he, you know, would likely win a majority government, he's, he's going to push the big red button. He's going to go for it. Now, the reason I was wondering about the election, the potential of an election, is from all of the Liberal handouts here. But at the same time, we got to pay the money back. Those are taxpayers' dollars. And our debt, Rachel, is approaching $1.3 trillion. Is this sustainable? Yeah, how well, it's it's a great question. It's a really good question, and I think it's one that many Canadians are asking. You know, we're we're trying just to manage a household budget. Uh, when we hear a number like 1.3 trillion, it's hard for us to fully, uh, you know, wrap our heads around. But when it comes to that amount of debt, um, we're talking about you know the inevitable, which is increased taxes and or a cutback on social programs. Um, which, you know, of course, as Canadians, we value those things. We, we value universal health care. We value knowing that the poor are going to be looked after if they hit hard times. Um, you know, those sorts of things are important to us. When a government takes on this amount of debt, it is inevitable that it will have to be pa paid back through taxation. Now, you mentioned on social media recently that it's outrageous that everyone around Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was aware of the misconduct allegations against General Jonathan Vance, but the PM didn't know anything about it. Do you feel the Liberals may be involved in a cover-up? Can you explain? Sure. One of the things that, that I observe here, Hal, is that the Prime Minister continuously is changing his answers. Um, and, you know, and I would say with the amount of information that is out there and the people that were close to him who knew, it would, it would appear to me that the Prime Minister would have to be willfully ignorant to not know something. Like, like he would have to purposely put horse blinders on in order to not see this. I mean, his chief of staff knew. He, you know, the, the Minister for National Defense knew. Like these, these are the types of people that should be reporting directly to the prime minister and bringing him in on, on scenarios like this, especially when the prime minister is claiming to be a feminist prime minister. You know, I, you would hope that he would be interested in knowing about something like this. And then you would hope that he would be interested in taking action on behalf of these women who, you know, who have these allegations and, and they're very serious allegations and they should be treated as such. So, yes, given the information that I have, um, you know, given the, the shiftiness in the prime minister's eyes when he goes to answer these questions in QP, I, I, you know, I would say certainly it seems like there is a cover up taking place here. And that's that's really sad. That's sad for Canadians. That's sad for these women. Bringing things a little closer to home now for just a moment. The application process for your 2021 Youth Advisory Board is now open and it's open for young people between the ages of 16 and 24. Can you explain what this is all about? <laughs> yeah, for sure, Hal. Um, this is this is something that I just so enjoy, um, and that is you know sitting around a table with young people and hearing their voices. So I I take eight people every year for a one year term, and they are between the ages of sixteen and twenty four, and we meet monthly. And they set the agenda and they lead the meeting. And my job is to listen and to ask good questions and to glean from them. And so um, it's an opportunity to give constituents who are young in age, uh, vibrant in spirit, and who have a passion for the community and political engagement to get involved and to have their voices heard while they develop relationship with me over the course of a year. I love that, giving young people a powerful voice. That's wonderful in our community. Now, on a more personal note, I heard you got engaged. Can you tell us a little bit about this young man? Yes, yeah, so, um, yes. so I just recently got engaged and uh, we'll be getting married at the end of June. So very excited about that. And uh, his name is Victor and he, he's from the prairies. And, uh, and now he, he is responsible for facilitating trade and business relationships between Canada and India, um, which of course is an, a rising economy and there's lots of opportunity there for Canada. And, uh, and I believe that we make a good partnership. So I look forward to being able to introduce him to the community more and more as restrictions lift. And he's also tall like you, right? So you guys can see eye to eye, <laughs> right? Yes, 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 that is true. He's, uh, he's about three inches taller than me, so works out well. Congratulations, Rachel. We're very happy for you. Thank you. Lethbridge MP Rachel Harder, thanks so much for your time today. Thank you for having me, Hal.
The federal government's plan to impose a $170 per ton carbon tax in place nationally by the year 2030 will result in 30,000 fewer jobs here in Alberta. Now that's according to a new study released by the Fraser Institute. Joining me now to talk about it from Guelph, Ontario, is the co-author of the study, Dr. Ross McKittrick, a professor of economics at the University of Guelph and a senior fellow at the Fraser Institute. Dr. Ross, welcome back to Bridge City News. Thanks, good afternoon. Now the federal government has said the higher carbon tax will have almost zero impact on the economy, but your study suggests otherwise and will in fact have a major impact on employees across the country, including here in Alberta. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was never credible of the government to say a tax of this magnitude would have no effect on the economy. I don't know why they would say that, but they've also not released any analysis of it. So if they have some magic model that gives them that result, then they should release the details. But uh, otherwise, I think it just represents wishful thinking on their part. The analysis that we did at the Fraser Institute uses a very conventional uh, macroeconomic modeling framework. And one of the points that I made in the report was that when we look at all the modeling work that was done by the government for the Kyoto Protocol about 20 years ago, for similar size emission reductions, we're just getting roughly the same numbers that they were getting back then, including the employment impacts. So. Um, I think that their claim that their plan would have no impact on the economy was never credible, and I think the numbers that we've published here are a lot more realistic. Now, you estimate a 1.8% decline in gross domestic product. How did you actually come up with that number? The model that we used, uh, it's a uh, called a National Computable General Equilibrium Model. The, the title doesn't really matter too much, but like I say, this is a standard macroeconomic modeling tool similar to ones that have been used inside the government and in the private sector. It traces the way um, cost increases like a, in this case a carbon tax affect markets across the country. The price increases cause people to adjust their buying patterns. They buy less of some things, they'll substitute into other things. Businesses respond including by reducing hiring in some areas and then in this particular type of model, um, we don't look at the transition stage where people are put out of work uh, and so you have a surge of unemployment at first. We're looking at the, um, the stage after the adjustment where the people who've been put out of work in one sector as much as possible are re-employed in other sectors, including sectors that might expand because of the, the rebate payments and things like that. So the job losses are net of the gains that the government is pointing to from the rebates and the new spending that they're proposing. So Dr. Ross, when the government says, don't worry about it, this will have zero impact on the economy, what do you think they're really basing that on? Well, I wish they would tell us. I wish they would release the analyses that supports that claim. I don't find it credible. And it's a big difference from the case 20 years ago, around the time of the Kyoto Protocol. They had multiple teams working on the modeling and the economic analysis, and they put out a lot of information so that we could see for ourselves um, what the numbers look like. And those analyses were influential on the government. They actually backed away from their plans to aggressively try to achieve the Kyoto targets because they could see the costs. This time, what we have is the government saying, it's not gonna cost anything, but we're not releasing any analyses to back that claim up. So um, it's a good question. You, you've asked exactly the right question. What are they basing it on? I know that they have people inside the government who can do this kind of analysis but I'm afraid that um, either they've done the analysis, they didn't like the numbers, or they haven't actually done it. And um, either way, I don't think it's fair to Canadians. I think that they should um, do what they did last time, have multiple teams within the government work on this, put out a range of, of uh, studies, and let's, uh, let's all see the numbers together. I was chatting with Dan McTagg, former Liberal MP and President for Canadians for Affordable Energy, and he says this carbon tax is really an attack on humanity, especially with the Liberals saying they want to, go, want to go to net zero emissions by the year 2050. Now, Dr. Ross, one of the arguments used by supporters of the carbon tax is that Canadian workers will be okay because of the carbon tax rebate. How would you respond to that? 
Well, uh, it certainly helps cushion the blow. Uh, here again, though, the government is is saying um, they're putting up promotional statements saying that most Canadians will be made better off by the whole tax uh, package. Uh, I think there's a few deficiencies with that. Um, first of all, we found in our analysis that in every province, uh, average per capita household consumption goes down. So on average, um, people are worse off. And um, even with the rebates, people are still spending more uh, through the carbon tax than they're getting. But another part of the problem here, and I haven't heard the government address this at all, is because the economy shrinks as a whole, um, other levels of government, both the federal and the provincial governments, are getting less in tax revenue on the rest of the economy. The income tax base will shrink, uh, the sales tax base shrinks, and so they have a hole in their revenue that they have to make up. And they're either going to uh, have to cut spending or increase taxes somewhere. And so they need to take account of how that's going to impact households as well. And I haven't heard a good explanation from them about how they're going to deal with that. So again, I think um, their claim that everybody or most people end up better off because yes, you're paying a pretty high carbon tax, but you're getting rebates. Um, I don't think that holds up on close inspection. Now, we tend to think of the carbon tax affecting the price of fuel and our home heating as well. But what about other areas this will have an immediate impact on when it comes to our cost of living? Well, uh, with an economy like Canada's, everything that uses energy is now going to have to go up in price because the producers of those goods and services, they're now paying more as well. So transportation, um, anything that uses motor vehicles, trucking, uh, for instance, but also agriculture. Um, farmers, of course, are, are big consumers of fuel for um, the um, operations of a farm. So their outputs become more expensive. Um, so it isn't just the cost of gasoline. It's all the indirect price effects that work their way through everything uh, that we uh, buy and sell. Um, those cost impacts um, especially in the, the area of transportation intensive um, goods and services. Canada is a big country. We have long distances to travel. Um, out in the Maritimes, for instance, a lot of things have to come long distances to get there. Um, but also on the prairies, as you know, um, you, you have long distances to cover. And so that factors into Canadian cost of living, uh, just the transportation budget. You know what exactly I'm thinking as well of uh, jet fuel you know, and hopping on an airplane to go visit my kids out in southern Ontario, it'll cost me more as well because Air Canada or WestJet, they're going to pass the increased cost on to me, the consumer, right? So, yeah, it'll impact so many well, different it's, people. It's the whole logic of, of the policy, and it, it, it makes sense from an economic point of view. If you want people to use less fuel, you'll have to charge more and get them to cut back. But it does mean that people are paying more. So the policy wouldn't work if you didn't make fuel more expensive. Right. Now, as far as fighting climate change goes, to what degree will the carbon tax affect emissions? How effective will it really be? Right now, um, that's the, the, big, uh, the big unanswered question. The, the problem with things like heating fuels, uh, transportation fuels, um, the demand for those kinds of, of energy, it's what we call inelastic. It means it's not very responsive to price. That's why taxes are high to begin with on gasoline. It's a good thing to tax because you can put a tax on it and people still have to use it. Um, for the government, if it wants to raise revenue, you don't put a big tax on something that people will stop using as soon as you put the tax on. So we've long known that gasoline, for instance, um, is not very responsive to price changes, at least um, in the short run. And um, so um, in order to get emissions down a long way, you have to increase the tax quite high. And um, so the, um, uh, the big question is, will they succeed in getting emissions down if people just keep using the fuels and are willing to pay more? Um, we'll have to wait and see. But the calculations that we did are they will get part of the way to the Paris targets, but they still are going to need to uh, um, uh, increase the tax even higher if they want to hit the Paris target. 
Business owners have been hit very, very hard during the pandemic, especially with the lockdowns and the restrictions. Uh, there was a report from Restaurants Canada, more than 10,000 restaurants have gone under so far across the country. Now let's talk about a carbon tax on top of the restrictions and the lockdowns. What kind of an impact will the carbon tax have on a lot of business owners? Well, I think you can um, pretty much predict that it's, uh, it's a burden on top of the very tough circumstances that they're in. Um, the um, restaurant, hotels, the, the whole travel sector, um, but also a lot of stores. Um, right now, they are looking at just trying to stay alive long enough to have a chance to recover when um, eventually, hopefully, the, the pandemic passes. Um, we're, um, uh, as I'm sure you and your viewers all know, it's taking a lot longer than we had hoped. And um, that means we are looking at at least another year of um, very tough circumstances, especially for restaurants. Now, restaurants are big users of natural gas, and um, they're also purchasers of food inputs that will be affected by this. Um, so I, I am a bit concerned that uh, the nature of the carbon tax is that it, it does involve a fairly large percentage price increase for natural gas over the, the whole implementation period. Now, Dr. Ross, do you have any thoughts on Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole's newly released climate plan that includes a $20 per tonne carbon charge on fuel? Will this be effective, or is it even actually a carbon tax? Um, I think calling it a charge rather than a tax is just semantics. Um, I would say, from, from my perspective, $20 is a much better... Um, price than 170 in terms of being a lot closer to the kinds of estimates of what the appropriate carbon tax is, um, what we call the social cost of carbon. Um, however, it's not going to have a big effect on emissions. Uh, one of my concerns with the conservative approach to this is I think they recognize that this is not a good time to impose um, really costly measures on the economy and, and these are not policies that have a very strong motivation behind them and yet at the same time they're saying they're going to achieve the Paris targets just as fast or even faster than the Liberals. I don't think they can square those two halves of or they can't reconcile those two halves of their position. Um, I think um, even with the Liberals, I mean, they they don't have a plan to achieve the Paris targets. They have a plan for uh, carbon tax and other regulatory measures, but I don't think anyone really believes that they're going to get all the way to the Paris targets with what they've announced. And with the Conservatives, the gap is even larger. And I just wish that some of these federal parties would just be up front with Canadians and say, we made this promise back at the Paris meeting, but we didn't really know what we were promising. And it turns out it's not a realistic target for us. So rather than crush the economy at a, a time like this, why don't we just um, step back a bit and ask what's a reasonable target for us to take on, given we're such a small player, especially on, on the, the uh, global stage. Um, let's talk about what's a reasonable target and do that rather than try to achieve an arbitrary and largely meaningless policy that was made without any analysis. How about the Biden administration, now that they're in power here with the Democrats in the United States, are they also trying to meet these Paris targets? Well, they said that they're going to rejoin uh, the Paris Accord and uh, meet their targets. Ironically, the United States has reduced its emissions quite a bit more than Canada has, but that's partly because they had a large fleet of coal-fired power plants that when they retired, they were switched over to natural gas. But they have the same challenge as we do, long geographical distances, a growing population. I mean, that's more than anything for Canada. That's the driver of our increased emissions. We have a rapidly growing population, and the government wants the population to keep growing. It's the same in the United States. They're population is growing and um, so that means more people driving more people using fuels and um, so the biden administration i think they they see this as a chance to do a bit of what i would call virtue signaling on the world stage they're going to rejoin the paris target but it's unlikely they're going to put a package of policies that gets through congress that um, would actually get them 
the kinds of emission reductions that are required. Dr. Ross McKittrick, Professor of Economics at the University of Guelph, thanks for joining me today. My pleasure. And behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News, I'm Hal Roberts. God bless and thanks for watching.